Welcome to Introduction to Logic, Unit 2, an introduction to Aristotelian deduction. In this series of short videos, we'll explore some of the main concepts in Aristotelian, or term, logic. In Lecture 1, we'll begin with an overview of the building blocks of Aristotelian deduction, the four categorical propositions. In the second lecture, we'll learn at how we can make simple deductive arguments by immediate inference when we combine pairs of categorical propositions together. And in the third section, we'll learn how to construct syllogisms using categorical propositions. We'll also introduce Venn diagrams in this unit and learn how to use these diagrams to visualize the logical properties of categorical propositions as well as to verify the validity of categorical syllogisms. It's hard for us to understand, but there was a time when there was no rational thinking as we understand it today. For the vast majority of human history, the only available answer to the question why for any event in the world was in the form of narrative or story. But this mythological worldview held that the world was the way it was because that's what the gods or ancestors or spirits of nature, it varied from culture to culture, willed the world to be like. And because these beings, who were the causes of the world, were beyond our ability to fully comprehend, the universe was essentially mysterious. In the mythological worldview, understanding the universe was essentially above our pay grade. So comprehending who we were, why we were here, and where we were going could only be expressed in the stories passed down from one generation to the next, first orally, then after the agricultural revolution about 8000 BCE, in written language. But another revolution, the philosophical revolution, would introduce a new way of thinking about the world, Lagos. The shift from mythos to logos only began in the 7th century BCE, which, when compared to the whole of human history, was really just yesterday. And it should be noted that there are plenty of people alive today who still live in a world dominated by the mythological paradigm. But in archaic Greece, this new way of thinking about the world was beginning to take root, and through a series of fortunate accidents would spread across the Near East and then advance westward, and eventually come to dominate the worldview, the one that we take for granted today. But one of the things that's really interesting is that it wasn't until Aristotle, 200 years after the philosophical revolution began, that anyone seriously examined this new way of thinking, this rational worldview. It was Aristotle's investigation into the nature of rational thought itself that made logic a distinct subject matter, as well as the identifiable methodology by which rational thinking would proceed right down to the present moment. We certainly don't have time to investigate all of Aristotle's logical writings, known as the Organon, or even the whole of the prior analytics, where he articulates in detail for the first time in human history the way deductive and inductive reasoning work. But we must pause, if only for just a moment, to acknowledge the monumental contribution to humanity that he's made. Aristotle recognized that logos, rational thought or argument, can start with general knowledge and conclude particular information, which we call deduction, or it can start with a particular observation or set of observations and infer general conclusions, which we might call induction. Everything we take to be significant knowledge today all areas of academic investigation from mathematics to sociology, from physics to art history, from philosophy to computer science, all of them use one or both of these methods first recognized and identified by Aristotle. And in this unit, we are going to give the briefest possible introduction to, or overview of, the deductive side of the science of rational thinking, or logic.
Aristotle's system of deduction is built upon the foundation of the categorical proposition. Now, we've already learned that a proposition is the meaningful content of a statement, but what makes a proposition categorical? The answer is simple. Whenever a proposition asserts or denies a relationship between two classes of existing things. Well, maybe that's a little too simple of an answer, but hey, look, it'll do for present purposes. All categorical propositions are composed of three essential component parts. The two most important are called terms. Now, the simplest way to begin thinking of the terms is by remembering your grammar. All complete statements must contain a subject and a predicate. There's whatever it is you're talking about, and there's what you want to say about it. In the same way, in Aristotelian or term logic, there's the subject term and the predicate term. It might also be helpful to think of these terms as sets. There's the set of things you want to talk about, and then there are the things that you want to say about that set. Here are some ex simple examples, though we'll see in a moment these aren't quite yet in proper form. Here we see that we want to talk about the set of things that are properly thought of as cats. That's our subject term. And then there's what we want to say about them, which is our predicate term. Similarly, in this example, we're asserting that the things that are possums are also marsupial things. In this case, notice that we're denying a relationship between the subject and predicate terms, but the subject term is still the subject of which we are predicating the lack of fur. Notice that between the subject and predicate terms, in each one of these statements, there are verbs connecting them. That is the copula, which is just a fancy Latin word for connector. Now you can impress your friends at parties with your knowledge of esoteric dead languages. Seriously, though, just asserting terms, be they subjects or predicates, won't do at all. We need to be saying something about the two terms, and that's the power of this little copula. It's where the magic happens, logically speaking. It's what creates the connection between the two sets, the subject set and the predicate set, the subject term and the predicate term. We're not just shouting cats, mammals, into the void. In a categorical proposition, we're asserting a relationship, positive or negative, about the two terms. Here again, we see the magic happens because of the copula. And even more mysteriously, in our third example, the copula lets us assert that something isn't the case of massive objects hurtling through the void. So copulas are very important parts of categorical propositions. You can't have a categorical proposition without the copula. Now, before we go any further, we need to circle back to something I said a moment ago. You remember I said our examples weren't quite in the right form yet. Well, that's because we've not spelled out clearly enough exactly what our terms entail. We know we're talking about kinds of things, or categories of things, or sets of things and their properties. But just how many are we talking about? And what specifically is the relationship between the two classes? For this, we'll need to add quantifiers and qualifiers. Just how many cats are mammals? If it's the case that every member of the subject class is properly modified by the predicate class, we need a universal quantifier. But again, that modification can mean that all members of the subject class are modified by the predicate class, or none of them are. Similarly, we might want to indicate that not all, but some members of the subject set are or are not members of the predicate class. Putting all this together, we discover that we actually have four, and only four, categorical propositions. 
The universal affirmative asserts that all members of the subject class are members of the predicate class. The universal negative tells us that not one member of the subject class is part of the predicate class. The particular affirmative tells us there's at least one member of the subject class. That's a member of the predicate class. And as you can guess by now, there's the particular negative. And it tells us that there's at least one member of the subject class that is not a member of the predicate class. These four statements exhaust all of the propositional content we can express regarding two classes of things, which is really useful if, like Aristotle, you're not just interested in philosophical topics like metaphysics and axiology, but also interested in understanding the things that exist in the world and why they are what they are, and perhaps even more importantly, what they aren't. Now, in the late 19th century, an English philosopher named John Venn introduced a handy little tool that allows us to visualize the logical relationship that exists between the terms of categorical propositions. We start by taking two circles of the same size and allowing them to overlap just a bit. One circle will represent the subject term, while the other represents the predicate term. Notice that when we overlap the circles, we create three distinct regions or sets. Region 1 represents the set of subjects that are completely and utterly distinct from the predicate class. Region 2 represents the set of both subjects and predicates, that is, it's the region where we have overlap between the two sets. While region 3 represents the predicates that are completely and utterly distinct from the subjects. Using this Venn diagram, we can visualize what's being said in a categorical proposition like this universal affirmative statement. It's telling us that region 1 is empty. But in order to indicate that a region is empty, we adopt a procedure of shading out that region on the diagram. By shading out region 1, we've indicated that there are no members of the subject class that are not also part of the predicate class, because there are no members of the subject class in region 1, since by shading it, we've said that it's empty. There simply exist no members of S in region 1. Thus, the only remaining subject members are also members of the predicate class. Hence, all S are P. Every single member of S is also a member of P. Now, note that this statement doesn't tell us anything about the members of the predicate class that are not members of the subject class, that is, region 3. There may not even be any existing things in region 3. We just don't know. And since we don't know, we don't do anything else to the diagram. Our Venn diagrams should only reflect what the proposition absolutely demands, what is made explicit in the proposition. Now let's look at a universal negative proposition. This proposition is telling us that there are no members that are shared between the two sets. In other words, this proposition is telling us that region 2 is going to be empty. In order to indicate that on the diagram, in order to visualize it, we need to eliminate that region, and so we shade it out. By shading out region 2, we have eliminated anything existing in that area that shares properties of both classes. Now we can see that there are no members of S that are also members of P. That is, no S are P. Now, we've learned that for universal propositions, we shade an area to indicate that it's empty. But particular claims are only making an assertion about one thing not the whole class of things. In logic, the word sum just means at least one. 
So to visualize the particular affirmative claim, we can't shade out regions 1, 2, or 3, as that would empty the whole region. To indicate the presence of at least one thing, we'll adopt a convention of using an X as a symbol to indicate the existence of one thing in the region that's indicated by the proposition. The particular affirmative tells us that there's at least one thing that is a member of both the subject and the predicate classes. There may be more, we just don't know. But what we do know, according to this proposition, is that there is at least one. So we've placed an X in region 2 to visualize the logic of the particular affirmative claim. You should be getting the hang of it by now. Since the particular negative claim is going to tell us that there exists at least one member of the subject class that is not a member of the predicate class, we are going to place the X in region 1. There's only one little thing you need to remember about Venn diagrams for categorical propositions. That is, shading empties or eliminates a region, placing an X indicates that there is at least one thing in that region. There could always be more, but we know, or it must be the case, that there is at least one thing. Now we're ready to summarize everything that we've covered so far. We have four categorical propositions. All SRP is both universal in its quantity and affirmative in its quality, while no SRP is universal but negative. Some SRP is particular because it's only telling us about one thing and it's affirmative, while some SR not P is particular but negative. Now, logicians are a little bit lazy by nature and we don't like to do any more work than we absolutely have to. So a long time ago, way back in the Middle Ages, logicians adopted a kind of shorthand referring for the four categorical propositions. They use the first four vowels of the Roman alphabet to stand for these four propositions. This allows us to speed things along a bit so we don't have to write out the whole proposition or state its quality and quantity whenever we want to refer to one of the four propositions. Thus, we'll use the letter A as shorthand for the universal affirmative. We'll use the letter E for the universal negative. I will stand for the particular affirmative, and O will represent the particular negative. Now there's just one last concept that we need to introduce to conclude our overview of categorical propositions. That's the concept of distribution. A term in a categorical proposition is said to be distributed when that term indicates all the members of a given class of things. Anytime a categorical proposition tells us something about the whole class, we say that term is distributed. Taking a look at the A proposition, we clearly see that the subject term is distributed since we're talking about every single member of the subject class. That's what all S means. Now the E proposition may be a little bit less clear on its face, but thinking about it will make it clear that both terms are distributed since we are excluding the whole class of S from the whole class of P. In the particular affirmative, or the I proposition, we're told something only about one thing, that there is one member of S that's also a member of P, but this doesn't tell us anything about the whole class of S or about the whole class of P. So in the I proposition or claim, neither the subject nor the predicate is distributed. Like the universal negative, the O claim may not be prima facie clear about distribution, but a little reflection will make it clear that since the one S we're talking about is excluded from the P, the entire class of P, the entire set of P, it's just not just some of P that S is excluded from, but rather the whole class of P. Therefore, 
the predicate, or P, is distributed in the O proposition. I think looking at our Venn diagrams will make this absolutely clear. The Venn diagram for the A proposition demonstrates that region 1 is completely empty. Thus, everything that is S is also P. Since all the S's are being indicated in this proposition, the subject term is distributed. But notice again that region 3 may or may not be occupied. The proposition doesn't specify what's going on in region 3, so the only part of P that this claim tells us about is region 2. Thus, only the subject is distributed, but not the predicate. The Venn diagram for the universal negative makes it quite clear that both terms are distributed. The universal negative tells us that S and P share no members in common. So this statement is making a logical assertion about the whole class of S and the whole class of P. They are both utterly distinct from one another. More simply put, both terms are distributed since we're talking about all the members of both classes. The I proposition only tells us about one thing, the one member of S that also happens to be a member of P. Hence, from this claim, we can't know anything about the whole class of S's, or about the whole class of P's for that matter. There could very well be members of S that are not members of P, and there could well be members of P that are not members of S. We just don't know. So in the particular affirmative claim, neither of the terms is distributed because we're not talking about the whole set of either one. The O proposition can sometimes seem a little tricky, but again, if we look at the Venn diagram, we see what we know logically is that one member of S, the one indicated by the X, is outside the whole class of P which means that the predicate term is distributed by this statement. Again, any statement that tells us something about the whole set of a term is distributed. So A, E, and O all have distributed terms, but I does not. Now you may be wondering why this is so important well, we're going to come back to that when we start putting together syllogisms in Aristotelian logic, but trust me, it is important, and understanding it now is going to make our work later much, much easier. So you have to understand the concept of distribution. In distribution, we're talking about the whole set. Anytime we're talking about the whole set within a term, that term is distributed. Now in this brief video, you've learned about Aristotle's categorical propositions, which are logical statements showing a connection between kinds or categories or sets of things. We've labeled these sets the subject and the predicate terms, which is why this form of logic is also sometimes referred to as term logic. You've learned that by applying quantity and quality to our terms, we can create four distinct categorical propositions. The universal affirmative, the universal negative, the particular affirmative, and the particular negative. You've also learned about the concept of distribution, whereby a categorical proposition makes an assertion about a whole class of things. As we see in the A proposition, the universal affirmative, the subject is distributed. In the universal negative, or E proposition, both terms are distributed. In the I proposition, or particular affirmative, neither term is distributed. While in the O proposition, the particular negative, the predicate term is distributed. Finally, you also learned about Venn diagrams which we can use to visualize the ob logical implications of our four categorical propositions. Now, in our next short video, 
we are going to learn about the logical relationships that exist between these four categorical propositions, and how we can use those relationships to build very simple deductive arguments using immediate inference, and the square of opposition. That's the subject for next time, so see you then.